Okay, let's see. So today we're gonna finish up the flooding chapter. So we can start with uh, with some topography tomorrow. Uh, I don't need this. And I will Wonderful, wonderful. Okay. Um, so this is where we left off yesterday, and this is really what we want to talk about today um, with flooding. So we're going to start off with effects, then we're going to go to natural service functions, um, the good parts of floods. And then we're going to go to preventative measures, what different towns can do to try to stop floods from happening or make them not as worse. Um, so obviously, the primary effects of floods are going to be injury and loss of life, uh, damage caused by currents, debris, sediments to farms, homes, buildings, railroads, bridges, uh, pretty much anything that touches the ground can be damaged by water. Uh, and then erosion and deposition of sediments related to loss of soil and vegetation. Um, this would also go with erosion near roads and buildings and stuff. So even if the building doesn't get damaged, um, you have to fix that erosion. One of the things I kind of think about with this is here in Texas, we have a lot of overpasses that have these artificial hills. Um, and after big storms or floods that happen nearby, uh, those hills that kind of prop up your bridge can start to erode away. Uh, even though the bridge isn't damaged yet, they have to spend a lot of money fixing that so the damage doesn't happen in the future. Uh, let's see. Secondary effects of flooding, short-term river pollution, uh, hunger and disease, and homelessness um, are all short-term things that, that have to be dealt with, uh, especially when you have floods over large areas that affect a lot of people. Uh, so let's see. Factors that affect damage caused by floods. Um, land use on the floodplain. This is like the number one thing with floods, um, especially in developed countries. If, if you have a major flooding disaster, usually it's a lack of planning from someone in that area that, that was developing the city. Um, you let people build their houses where they shouldn't. Um, you let a business come in and change the flow of water where you shouldn't. Um, it, it's all very simple, and a lot of people don't don't really think about it until the rain has already started to fall. And at that point, you're kind of in trouble. Um, and so it sounds crazy, but every time you build a building, every time you have to put in a new parking lot, um, you need to bring in geologists and engineers to find out what your water is going to do. Because it may not seem like you're adding very much, um, but the next time you have a really big rain, you could have a flood where you've never had a flood before. Uh, so how you use your land and how you place your buildings is very, very important. Uh, obviously, how much water falls and how fast it's flowing, um, that's going to greatly affect your erosion. Uh, so when your water's flowing very, very fast, it can pick up a lot of material and erode it away. Um, rate of rise and duration of flooding, this just kind of means how, how fast it happens and how long that flooding stage happens. Um, obviously, houses that are underwater for like weeks are going to be permanently damaged. Where if the water comes in and goes back out in a day, uh, you know you could maybe dry that out and salvage a lot of material. Um, but you know if it's underwater for for over a week, probably not going to be any good anymore. Um, another thing that maybe didn't mention is uh, the amount of cars that get damaged every year in flooding. Um, and once a car gets kind of submerged underwater, um, there's a lot of work that has to be done to get it back into running shape. Uh, let's see, season of the year the flood takes place, uh, quantity and type of sediment transported and deposited, and the effectiveness of forecasting warning and evacuation, uh, how well they tell people about flooding beforehand. Um, and this is also tied back to land use on the floodplain. Um, if you don't know where the floods are going to happen or how bad they could possibly be, your ability to forecast and warn people um, is going to be very, very limited. And so the more you can understand about the flooding, the more you can warn people and they can kind of prepare for it. So linkages to other natural hazards. Obviously, hurricanes cause direct flooding. Um, we saw that here with Hurricane Harvey not too long ago. 
uh, just kind of sat over the southern part of the state and caused a lot of flooding. Um, secondary effects of flooding, earthquakes and landslide. Um, well, actually, I think they're saying here flooding is a secondary effect of earthquakes and landslides. Uh, when you have an earthquake, it can kind of undam a river. It can damage a natural made dam or a man made dam. Um, a landslide could come down and stop up a river. Um, so rivers are usually in valleys. So if you have a landslide come down the valley, it could stop up the river and create a natural dam, which can flood new areas. Um, fires uh, in our brain, we don't ex like associate fires with water. Um, but fires are a really big deal in flooded areas because humans uh, bury their electrical lines underground, usually right next to gas lines. Um, and so when we have floods, a lot of times we have electrical, electrical fires and gas fires that are associated with those uh, because of the floods. And then they can contribute to coastal erosion. Um, every time Florida has a hurricane, they lose a lot of beach sand. And that's, that's a big deal for them. Uh, we don't really have those problems around here, but it is a huge issue that costs a lot of money. So now, on to natural service functions. Um, remember, natural service functions is the nice way to say there are good things about this disaster. Um, some disasters don't have very many good things. Um, floods do have some, some positive attributes. So um, floods are no more of a natural, wait, Floods are no more than natural processes of overbank, overbank flow. Um, only becomes a hazard when people live or build on the floodplain or try to access flooded areas. Uh, natural service functions of floods, they bring in good sediments for farming. Um, so anytime you get a flood, you're, you're dropping some new sediments on that land, and that's going to help build up your soil. Um, they benefit aquatic ecosystems and allow them to diversify and spread out into different areas. Um, and they help keep land above sea level. Uh, the more flooding you have happen, the more sediment you're going to drop on your land, as opposed to all that sediment just be carried down the river to the ocean. Um, and so floods do help keep your land above sea level. This is also one of the reasons we like to dam up rivers uh, and make so many lakes, because it helps kind of trap the soil where close to where it started from. Uh, so fertile lands, they're just talking about bringing in soil into the floodplains and how this helps our agricultural production. Um, all those influx of minerals and nutrients helps the land. Uh, aqu aquatic ecosystems, floods help flush out the channels. Um, they're going to clear out big log jams and boulders and tree branches that are kind of stuck in there and just allow for a, a, a more uniform aquatic experience for the, the creatures that live there. Uh, sweep nutrients and other food supplies downstream and e increase the survival of aquatic organisms. And then there's a societal benefit where fishing is common. What is this societal benefit? I assume they're talking about humans because there's not really fish society, is there? Uh, so I guess I guess you make friends at the fishing hole after, after a flood is what they're saying. I don't know. That's a weird bullet point there. Um, Periodic flooding builds up elevation, and I apologize to any fish that live in a society with governments and whatnot. Uh, I'm just judging there. Maybe I don't know. There could be fish societies. Uh, periodic floods build up elevation. So this is talking about sediments. Um, and this is actually kind of true, and not kind of true. It's true and unique. Um, one of the things we talked about yesterday, which I think they show a picture of in a second. Um, yeah, levees. So like we build levees naturally to hold the river in, uh, not naturally, we build levees artificially to hold the river in. I thought there was a picture right here. Here, it's showing you some Mississippi River levees. Uh, rivers actually, some rivers, not all, when they flood, they will actually build like an artificial levee on the side. Um, and so that's a part of kind of preventative measures that we didn't design ourselves. We kind of took from natural rivers that do this. So let me go back to where I was. I shouldn't have gone that far. Here we go. Uh, da, 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 periodic flooding helps build up elevation, keeps areas above sea level. They're referring to New Orleans here. Um, without floods, New Orleans really wouldn't be at the level that it is now. 
all of that soil would have been flown out into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and so those floods helped keep a lot of that soil on the land around New Orleans and southern Louisiana. Uh, may help prevent some damage and flooding caused by hurricanes. Uh, yeah, the more floods you have and the, bit, the more your elevation is built up by dropping those sediments, when a hurricane actually does come, your land is going to be slightly above sea level, and so that could help with damage and flooding caused by hurricanes. Uh, what do we have here? Flooding. They're talking about Lake Powell, Upper Basin. They're just showing the Colorado River Basin. Uh, okay, so they're not really talking about flooding here. Um, they they are kind of showing you your two different. Um, the word just left my brain. Um, the two different catchment areas for these rivers. So it looks like uh, to enter into the upper part of the Colorado River and eventually go to the lake that is controlled by the Glen Canyon Dam. Um, if your water falls anywhere in this blue, this darker blue area, you're going to end up in the Colorado River and go through that dam. Um, and so that's actually quite a big area. That's like half of Colorado, a decent portion of Wyoming half of Utah, and then a little bit of New Mexico and Arizona. Every bit of rain that falls there is going to go into the Colorado River and go through the Glen Canyon Dam. Uh, down here, the light blue catchment area is going to ultimately end up in that river. Where does it run out at? I guess it runs out into the Gulf of California. So that's where it's heading out down here. Um, so everything that falls in the light blue area is going to end up joining these streams and rivers and heading out into the Gulf of California, um, which ironically is in Mexico and is not attached to California. Uh, let's see. Human activity can significantly affect river processes, including magnitude and frequency. When we build a lot of stuff next to the rivers, we don't allow the water to soak in. Um, you can have floods that are, are much bigger than they should be and happen much more often than they should. Um, Case in point, we don't have a lot of flooding here uh, in the DFW Metroplex, but if you go into Dallas, um, every time it rains really hard, there are certain intersections that flood. Under the bridge will flood. Uh, and so it's just a matter of land use and how the water flows, uh, and they just don't handle it very well in certain places. Uh, activities that affect flooding, land use changes, dam construction obviously will affect flooding, um, and urbanization, building of uh surfaces that don't soak in the water so any buildings any parking lots any streets and roads um those are going to definitely affect how your water is absorbed and whether you have floods or not uh land use changes River, rivers generally maintain dynamic equilibrium a balance between gradient cross-sectional shape and flow um, so basically what they're making the argument here is um rivers kind of balance everything out they're, the same processes control rivers um, gravity is pulling water downhill. It's all about the amount of water and the sediment that you're running through it. Um, but they all kind of follow this, this same pattern. When we start to go in and change different things, that can affect that equilibrium. Um, one of the things I think of most often is we like to come in and build houses next to creeks because um, creek houses are, are uh, a valuable commodity. And then when you build your house next to the creek, inevitably you see that the creek is washing your land away. Um, it's constantly eroding. The creek bed is getting bigger and bigger. And depending on how close your house is built to that creek, um, you may put in efforts to try to keep that creek from eroding at all. You may like put in a bank, uh, people stack up the big landscaping scaping bricks. Um, there's lots of different ways you can try to stabilize a, a slope. Um, but people are basically worried about the creek taking all their property away. And so they kind of like, uh, uh, I don't know, urbanizing. Not, they, they like cement the side or put a bunch of bricks up and try to keep that soil from flowing. That's changing the equilibrium of the stream. That's preventing erosion where erosion naturally happens. Um, there's all sorts of stuff we do to that. Uh, forest of farming creates more erosion and sediment. Uh, sediment will build up the gradient of the stream. Um, and what that means is the more sediment you create, so let's say you cut down a bunch of forests 
and create farmland. That's going to produce a lot of sediment. The sediment is going to kind of stop up the stream and it's going to get rid of all that downward motion that it kind of has. It's going to build up the stream bread and it's going to create a more slow flowing stream that spreads out uh, and it just changes the overall way that the stream's working. So, uh, change the stream bed from land use. So, this is just showing um, how much erosion you've had in these, uh, in between these years. So, 1930, your stream bed was way up here. 1969, your stream bed is way down here. Um, these look like kind of natural levees that have been built up on the side, but they don't really talk about those. Uh, and then they show the original bank prior to agriculture. So they're saying, they're saying what? I don't know. This seems a little backwards, right? I mean, just looking at it, the original bank prior to agriculture. Okay, this was the original bank. The river was wider and deeper than it currently is. So you're telling me you start agriculture, and I assume it's producing a lot of sand, a lot of sediment, which is going into the river and clogging it up. Uh, if that's the case, maybe these would be switched? Because wouldn't the agriculture just make it worse? Why would it be worse in 1930, but then get better in 1969? And why, sorry, I just have questions. Why in 2015, do we not have a 2015 representation here? The, the most recent data you have is 1969. Uh, I don't know. I don't understand what this is trying to tell us. But uh, be careful how you change your land. It can definitely affect your rivers and streams. So let's see. Uh, dam construction. Upstream, as water enters the reservoir, it slows down, deposits sediments, and forms a delta. Basically, you're creating a lake. Um, whenever you make a dam, you're creating a lake on the, the upstream side of that. Um, and it, water is going to behave as if it were entering a lake or an ocean. So it's going to slow down, lose all its sediment, and it's going to form a delta. Um, this, in a small version, is the reason why Palmer has so many ponds. Um, because each of those ponds is designed to catch that sediment coming off of those farmlands. So the farmers can go in every, I don't know how often, uh, and, and dig all that soil out and spread it back on their farm. And that keeps them from losing soil, which is actually very expensive. Uh, downstream, as the water leaves the dam, it has lost all of its sediment. So as soon as it leaves the dam, it's going to pick up a lot more sediment. It's going to erode as much as it can and try to take that sediment downstream. Um, and so the so slope of the stream will decrease until the equilibrium is re reached. Uh, equilibrium is what they're always after. Gravity, uh, the natural forces of Earth are always going to try to get you down to equilibrium. So here's what they show. They're kind of showing an example of that uh, right now. Oh, no, they're not. Uh, well, there was a sequence of these, I thought. Maybe it was in the previous uh, PowerPoint. But they kind of showed this sequence. This was a natural stream. Um, at some point in time, they dam it up. The lake fills up. You have your new kind of deposition and delta down here. Um, but one of the things they're saying is, because I drop all my sediment into the lake, the water that comes out of the dam is really clean. It doesn't have any sediment in it. And so it's predisposed to come out of this dam and erode a lot of stuff. Uh, where right when the dam was released, you still kind of had a nice incline here where the river would roll downhill. Uh, but you can see there's been a lot of erosion. And what they're kind of making the argument is, is this lack of sediment in the river is going to cause this erosion to flatten everything out. Um, so instead of having that nice gradient, it's going to, the river itself is going to dig down into the ground and it's going to become more flat over that distance, uh, which is going to change what the river's doing. So, uh, urbanization and flooding obviously, the more we build, especially when you talk about cement uh, and concrete and parking lots and buildings, um, this is going to keep your land from soaking in the water. Um, and where the water can't soak in, it's going to run downstream or it's going to go downhill until it gets into a stream or a storm sewer or whatever it's going to be. 
and you're gonna have a lot more water. Um, so what they're saying here, uh, your rate, oh, okay. your rate is determined by the percentage of land that is covered up with something that's not gonna soak in water like concrete or cement. Um, the percentage of areas served by the storm sewers that are taking that out. And what they say is 40% in both can be expected about three times more floods. What? So a 40% increase of land that is impervious and a 40% increase uh, or a 40% of the area served by storm sewers can be, can expect about three times more floods. So I guess what they're saying is if you increase both of these by 40%, or have a 40% mark on both of these, you can expect about three times more floods than if you didn't have 40% on those. Um, and so that's actually, that's a pretty big number for what it is. 40% um, doesn't seem like much. There's definitely going to be urban areas um, in Dallas that are closer to 100%. Um, so 40%, you're probably talking like downtown, uh, Waxahachie, downtown Ennis, maybe a lot of cement, but not not crazy. Um, but you could experience three times more floods depending on how your your elevation is is worked out. So uh, it can be a huge effect that you get from just putting up a couple buildings and a couple parking lots. Let's see function of relationship between rainfall and runoff. Urban runoff can be five times more than pre-urban conditions. Uh, the condition of drainage system is also a factor. So you start to add cement, you can start to see your floods get worse um, by, by factors of multiplication. Urbanization increases in pervious cover. They're just kind of showing you an urbanization picture. And so in, in this, you can see there are some areas for water to be able to be soaked in, um, but not many. You have a lot of rooftops, a lot of parking lots, and very little uh, impervious land surface where your water can soak in. Overblank flooding before and after urbanization. What are they doing? Uh, this is just a chart. So they're just showing you um, the more storm sewers and impervious cover you get, the more often your river is going to overflow. And so this is your ratio of overblank flow. And they're showing you right at about 40%. You have that three times chance that you're going to have a flood. Um, so it's three times more likely. All right, and this is kind of what I showed you the other day with the lag time. Um, so on the left here, this box is going to be your rainfall. Um, so your storm comes in, it drops some rain. Um, in a normal scenario, your rivers don't flood until later. Um, there's that lag time because it takes time for all that water to slowly trickle down into the creeks and streams. Uh, some of it's never going to get there. It's going to get absorbed into the ground. It's going to get pulled up by plants. Um, there's lots of different things that can happen to your rain before it gets into the creeks and streams. But if I urbanize and I create more parking lots, I create more uh, cement spaces, roofs, buildings, all sorts of things, now the water can't absorb. And the surface it's running across is a lot smoother. Water will go down concrete much faster than it will go down like a grass slope. So. Your rivers fill up faster. You can see that the flood happens much closer to when the rainfall actually happens. And your peak is higher um, because I have more water getting there quicker. My peak is going to be higher and my flood is going to be a little bit more, uh, have a higher flood stage. Flooding in urbanization areas associated with problems or hazards. Um, I think they're just pointing out here, there's a couple things that they're trying to point out. But the main thing is um, your sewage, most of our sewage gets stored underground um, or in big sewage facilities. Um, if you have a flood by those, your sewage is not going to be contained very well. It's going to come out into the floodwaters, um, which is, again, why I told you don't go walking around in floodwaters. Um, they're usually not very sanitary at all. Okay, now, minimizing the flood hazard, what can we do to stop floods? Um, basically, if you look at a lot of this, it's a lot of physical barriers. It's us just trying to put up a wall to keep the flood out. Um, one of the things we can do is kind of channels. Um, so we can lead the flood in different directions. 
Um, but that only works in very specific areas where you have somewhere for the water to go. Uh, so they show you the picture of the Mississippi River, and you can see the levee right along the edge of the river. It's just kind of a big hill to protect these houses over here. Um, but like I mentioned the other day, levees are only good until they fail. And then when they fail, you can have extra problems. Um, like one of the things that could happen if your levee, if the river rises, and let's say your levee fails right here, um, all the water that can go in is going to rush through that levee and kind of flood these neighborhoods. Um, but there's also a downhill factor. So as the water flushes in through this neighborhood, it's going to run downhill just like the rest of the river is running. Um, and so the water that comes down here now doesn't have a way to escape back into the river if the river level were to go down. The levee is now keeping the floodwaters in the houses instead of let it, letting it go back in the river. Um, and so levees are good right up until the point they're not. And then once they kind of fail, um, they can cause even bigger problems than you might expect because they're keeping the water from moving in a natural way. Uh, let's see, retention ponds reduce flood discharge. Um, that's not necessarily why we have a lot of retention ponds here, but that is like the vast majority of ponds that you see in Palmer, those are gonna be considered retention ponds. Um, they're there to retain water and to retain soil from the farmlands that are coming off. Uh, one of the other effects it does is when they flood or when you have heavy rainfall, the pond has to fill up first before it starts to add water into the creek that's downstream. And so the ponds can kind of keep your flood from getting to that peak level and just spread everything out a little bit more. So uh, they work in a lot of good ways. Ponds are good things to have. All right, channelization. Um, channelization, let me show you right here. This is what they're talking about with channelization. Um, us literally going in and cutting a like a ditch in the ground to let water go a certain direction where it normally wouldn't go. Um, and so the idea is if you give the water a chance to get out into a different place, it will go there. Um, now, there are unintended consequences to channelization. So uh, we can straighten, deepen, widen, clear, or line existing stream channels or create our own. Um, and the objective is to include improved navigation and decreased flooding. But there are some drawbacks. Um, drainage adversely affects plants and animals, so you're taking water away where it's normally there. You're kind of create, uh, changing that equilibrium. That's not good. Uh, cutting trees eliminates shading and cover for fish and wildlife. Cutting trees eliminates many habitats. Um, also, the trees help prevent erosion. So uh, keeping those trees there helps keep your erosion from happening as badly. Uh, changing the stream bed destroys both the diversity of flow patterns and feeding and breeding areas for aquatic life um, and degrades the aesthetics. Let's see. Comparison of natural and channelized streams. Uh, so they're just showing you, this is what a natural stream looks like. Um, these are some of the things that it has going on for it. Um, when we come in and channelize that stream, we basically change all the natural proceedings of the stream, um, which in general makes it worse for wildlife. Um, maybe a little better for us because we're selfish like that, but um, usually not good for the things that are around us. Channel restoration alternative to channelization. Oh, this is just them um, basically finding a different way to do it. So instead of with this river, they're having some erosion where they don't want erosion to happen. Um, this is probably like a river that runs through a park. You can kind of see back here. It looks a little bit manicured. Um, so they want to keep the river the way that it is, but they don't want to come in and just like channelize it. They don't want to just straight cut it and make it this like a uh, sterilized thing. So they're just gonna come in and try to help a little bit. They're gonna drop a bunch of rocks along the bank. You can see them right here and right here to try to prevent erosion from happening as fast. It's still gonna happen, just gonna slow it down a little bit and kind of help out. So uh, this is a good example of how to do things uh, to, try to try to control nature, but do it in a way that's not necessarily changing it uh, completely. Oh, we almost to the end of it. I've been talking forever. 
Uh, precipitation and adjustment of flood hazards. What do we have? Flood insurance, flood proofing, flood plain regulation, relocating people from the flood plain. Um, insurance is all good and everything, but insurance is only going to do stuff after your house has already been flooded. Um, insurance won't prevent anything. Uh, and so it's nice to have if, if your house has been flooded, um, but doesn't really help you avoid a flood or anything like that. Um, flood proofing could be like building levees, um, building dams, uh, maybe using materials that aren't necessarily going to rot as quickly um, in flood water, waterproof materials. Uh, it could even involve putting in pumps in your house. So if water does start to get in, you can get it out quickly. Um, Floodplain regulation is really going to be the big deal. Um, it, it's hard to do because in general, when someone owns land in the United States, they want to be able to do whatever they want on it. Uh, and it's a sticky situation for a city to come in and say, yeah, you own this land, but you can't build a house here. Um, people can't live in this house. You've got to do something else with it. Uh, that's tough to do, but really... It's the best thing to do um, because once your house does get flooded, they look to the city and they're like, why'd you let me do this to myself? I built a house in a floodplain. It's going to get flooded like every 10 years. Uh, and the city's like, we tried to tell you, but you just did it anyways. Uh, so good, good floodplain regulation and city planning uh, is going to be key. And then uh, if you don't do good city planning and you let a bunch of people build in a floodplain, and then they find out it's in a floodplain. Now you have a problem because you can't just let these people get flooded out every five years or something and pay a bunch of money to have them go rescued. Uh, that's dangerous. So you might have to relocate people from the floodplain, uh, especially if it's a new floodplain where you created a new dam or the river has kind of changed for whatever reason. It didn't use to flood, but now it does. Uh, you're going to have to move that neighborhood. It's going to have to go somewhere else. So uh, that's always really tough to do. So ideally, you want to do good floodplain re regulation up front so you don't have to move people afterwards. Uh, let's see, perception of flood hazard, public knowledge of flooding, anticipation of future flooding, and willingness to accept adjustments caused by hazards um, is highly variable. I feel like you could just take the word flooding out of here and put uh, uh, viral pandemic and this sentence just makes like perfect sense. Uh, you know, our anticipation of it, our willingness to accept adjustments caused by the hazard um, is, is, you know, do you, do you want to move? Like you always see the hurricane coming. Um, and there's always the people that are like, yeah, I'm going to drive three states over and I'm going to wait for the hurricane to leave. Not only do I not want to be here, I don't even want to be in the next state. I'm going to go several states away. Um, versus the person who's like, nope, I'm not even leaving my house. I'm going to have the doors and windows open and we're going to have a party. Uh, it's just your own like perception of what's going to happen. Um, there's people who are like, uh, this is dangerous. I'm going to get out of here. And there's people that are like, there's no way this hurricane is ever going to knock my house down. I'm not leaving. Uh, so you can do your best to try to inform the public and let them know. Um, but people are always going to make their own decision. Um, I think of the guy who died on Mount St. Helens. Uh, they were like, hey, the mountain's going to blow up. you got to leave. He's like, nah, I think I'll just die here. And he did. Um, and it, that, maybe that's the way he wanted his story to end. There's a lot worse ways to go out than by, like, volcano explosion. So uh, maybe maybe he got what he wanted. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Local governments have prepared flood maps. Yeah. You want to look at flood maps and find out where where your flood's going to happen. Uh, federal government encourages local governments to adopt floodplain management plans. Public safety campaigns have been created to educate the public about flash flooding. Um, alternatives to cultural structural control. Yeah, 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 yeah. Flood insurance. Yeah, and basically this is what they do. You know, it's not so clear cut as this because usually the land's a lot more flat. Um, but you want to stay out of the 100-year floodplain. Um, if you're in a 100-year floodplain, you're rolling the dice. At some point in time in your life, you're more than likely going to experience a flood um, that you didn't really expect. And so if you're out of the 100-year floodplain, you're usually considered pretty safe. Obviously, you can have a huge, massive flood 
um, that's just like unprecedented, um, but it, it's not likely. And so, you know, up here, safe to build. Down here, in between 120, you're really rolling the dice. Um, under 20 years, like you're gonna get flooded pretty often. That's that's not a good place to build anything. Uh, you're just kind of wasting your money there. So if the city has an accurate map of this and can tell people up front and kind of regulate that, that's gonna be the best way to do that. Uh, raising foundations, flood proofing, uh, constructing walls or mounds. Yeah, 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 just trying to keep stuff from getting underwater. Um, using construction materials that are waterproof, installing pumps, uh, pretty much doing anything you can to keep flooding from happening. Um, floodplain regulation, flood hazard mapping. We've talked about all this. After development, before development. So they're kind of showing you uh, the little channel that was taking water out. Uh, it used to be deeper, and then it kind of got filled in with the development, and so it can't hold as much water. And so when it floods, it actually goes out into the surrounding buildings. Yes, floodplain zoning. So this is the idea, and you see this around the Trinity. Um, if the river could flood, you don't let people build right next to the river. It'd be nice if we could just go all the way to the edge of the river, but the reality is you need that buffer zone and kind of stay away from this. Um, this is also one of the reasons there are some Texas lakes where you cannot have a dock. Um, there's lots of lakes where you buy property right on the lake. You can build a dock right there. Um, but there's several Texas lakes that have this like buffer zone right around the shore. And you'll notice that there's no docks on the lake. Um, so you can buy lakefront property, but you don't actually own the little part that goes right up to the water. Oh, I forgot the building turned off. Young go. How long would you have sat here and let me continue to talk? Right, so yeah. <laughs> uh, me and Andrew won't be here tomorrow. Be here tomorrow.